Well, thanks for joining at midday, uh, at least here in, in uh, the Western Hemisphere. Um, I just wanted to kind of start a program where we could talk about things that are going on with Open NMS because it's so hard for everybody to keep up with everything. And I thought we could also, I'm going to try and screen record this and maybe share it out with the community later. Um, we're all here in North Carolina sitting here eating pizza. I don't know what everybody else is doing. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to quickly go over some changes that's been done for Horizon 23 with the respect to how alarms are managed uh, or how alarms are representing problems in your network. And basic, the, the, the basic uh, concept is to use a single alarm to track the state of a problem rather than what we've been doing in the past, what, 12 years <laughs> with, two, with two alarms. So, um, first thing, I'll probably talk a little bit about what, how alarms became the way they were in OpenNMS uh, and that legacy problem state tracking. Uh, then we'll move on to how we're doing it with a single alarm, and then if you guys have any questions, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, so in the beginning, there were just events, and that's why events have severities. Uh, so any message that happens on, happens on the event bus is basically just a, a queue that you can subs you can subscribe for different UEIs, and whether it's a message in the system to say restart a service or whether it's a message in the system about a trap that's come into the system, it's just an event. So what we did probably somewhere around 2006, I think, uh, is we decided to. Uh, create a behavior where messages could be identified as problems in the network and we call them alarms. Uh, we kind of followed a paradigm that Netcool had been using where there were you were using two uh, rows in your alarm table to represent the current problem and do pairwise correlation and that's kind of carried all the way through till today. Uh, it was a little redundant even though we had to, because we always have had the representing events as well. Um, and then it also used that same paradigm that Netcool Omnibus had for using uh, SQL statements to do uh, and, uh, escalations and correlations with the alarms. Uh, so uh, in the legacy way of doing things, you'll all see that, be familiar with this. This is just... Um, uh, an SNMP outage detected on my system, and I got an alarm, the count is one, and then when the problem is resolved, or I get another alarm that says the problem has been restored, and that, via an automation, clears the previous problem. Eventually, uh, a garbage collection automation will run and remove this, um, uh, but you can see if the problem happens again, uh, the, the previous, if it's still in the active alarm list, it will now have a count of two. It gets reset to its original severity. And then when it is restored again, then you can see also the resolving alarm gets its count incremented and clears the, the incremented uh, problem alarm as well. You can always go back and click on the... Um, on the counts and look at the list of events that uh, caused this to happen. So the the alarm data on the uh, on the events is what annotates these things to become alarms. Uh, this was just an I just wanted to capture this for posterity because in 23 this goes away as well because we've introduced the rules uh, engine to handle these uh, business rules or this logic and. You can see here in the automation called Cosmic Clear, which was the pairwise uh, correlation that we had, we would have a trigger that would go look for any alarms that were of a problem type that had matching clear keys in uh, alarms that had resolving types. And it would match that clear key to the reduction key. And we did that in the automation phase of of this uh, alarm uh, problem management. Now what we do is we do the same thing but we do it with code and it happens within alarm D. It takes a clear key and automatically uh, reduces it 
and sets it into the same alarm, but we'll see that here in a minute. Uh, so again, uh, the automations are now Drool's rules, and we'll probably use that for the subject of another lunch and learn. Might be a long one. <laughs> um, Bring your working memory. Exactly. <laughs> nice pun, Jeff. <laughs> um, uh, there's also now been introduced some properties for Alarm B where Alarm B had none before, and uh, we're using a single alarm to try to uh, represent the state of a problem in the network. Uh, no automation or drills required for the pairwise correlation. Uh, so you can see here um, we have a property set to go back to the old two alarm state. So you can come back and set this to true if you want to go back to doing the way things were. Um, there's also another property that's been introduced that we'll talk about uh, at the end of this. But if you set this to true, then that nullifies this property. Okay, uh, again, now the same problem with the single alarm state. Now we're in a down. Uh, this is the initial alarm. And you can see that the same alarm, which was alarm number 69, is um, the same alarm that's cleared, and the count is still one because the problem only happened once, even though there were two events that caused this problem. So when it reoccurs, if the alarm is still in the active alarm list, then it will increment the count, reset the severity. And when it clears again, again, the count is not incremented, but it does update the log message. Again, on the clear, it does update the log message, and it does set the problem type to 2 so that we know that it's in a cleared state. And that was the last thing that happened. Oop, wrong way. Again, there's been four events carrying this alarm around the system, and there's only been two counts of this problem. Uh, also, something that one of our customers asked for was if there is an existing problem that's been cleared, never let this happen where the count becomes two. So when it happens, what you can do is you can set this new if cleared problem is this, you can set this to true, and I should have probably done that in the slide. Okay. And then now what will happen is when the problem comes in, you'll still get the same behavior with, you can see where 163, alarm 163 gets cleared. But when it happens again, it now creates a new alarm to track the problem as a different alarm. And it does that by altering the reduction key of the previous alarm, adding just something to the end to make it unique, which is the a literal called ID colon and then followed by the alarm ID. That's not there by default? It's not by default. So only when the successor alarm is created, it alters its predecessor alarm? And only when this property is set to true. Right. And again, if you turn this single alarm handling off, then this gets defaulted to false. You can't use this feature <coughs> with the two alarm. I couldn't find a way to make that work very well. If we had persisted the clear key with the resolving alarm, I could have done it. And I think that's pretty much it. Again, when it happens again and clears, it now clears that one. And <coughs> subject to your questions, that completes my demonstration of new alarms in open elements. <laughs>